Hello, my name is Michele Spasaro, and I am a PhD student with the Wallace Transceivers Research Group at the Department of Engineering of Aarhus University in Denmark. Today, I'm going to present silicon spin qubit control readout circuits in 22 nanometer FDSOI CMOS, which I co-authored with Dr. Raffaele Roberto Severino and Professor Domenico Zito. This work has been co-funded by the European Union through the H2020 FET Open Project iQubit. I'm going to start by introducing the vision for a silicon-based monolithic quantum processor and the ambitious goals of the FET Open Project iQubits. Then I'm going to discuss silicon electron hole spin qubits, qubit control and readout techniques, and the preliminary design of qubit integrated circuits. Then I'll draw the conclusion. Quantum supremacy promises disruption in many fields of science and technology, but it requires highly scalable quantum processors. The early stage approaches rely on two separate chips, a quantum chip hosting the qubits and kept at a temperature that is typically lower than 100 millikelvin, and a classical chip hosting the control and readout circuits. This latter chip must be kept at a higher temperature in the order of 4 kelvin due to power consumption constraints. This multi-chip approach requires bulk instrumentation and interconnects, and the buy is not scalable. The main goal of iQubit is to develop and demonstrate experimentally the building blocks for a highly scalable quantum processor in ultra scaled, that is 22 nanometer and below, fully depleted silicon and insulator CMOS foundry technologies. In detail, the goal is to develop electron hole spin qubits operating at 3 Kelvin or above and co integrate the qubits with the uh, control readout circuits on the same chip. The basic system considered in a qubit comprises a, a, an FDSOI CMOS double quantum dot to host the qubits. A signal generator provides the signal needed to manipulate the speed state of the qubit, and a transimpedance amplifier amplifies the small tunneling currents which are produced in order to read out the spin state of the qubit. In this work, we addressed the preliminary design considerations for the signal generator and the transimpedance amplifier. Before discussing the designs, I'm going to give a very quick overview of electron hole spin qubits and the main spin manipulation and readout techniques. Quantum algorithms require the preparation of a qubit and superposition states. However, these states tend to decay with time due to unwanted interaction of the qubit with the environment. This process is known as decoherence, and one of the main advantages of silicon electron hole spin qubits are the long coherence times, which can also be improved by isotopic purification of silicon. Another main advantage is the compatibility with the manufacturing technology for integrated circuits, and thereby the potential for high scalability. Double quantum dots are physical systems which enable the implementation of both one qubit and two qubit quantum gates, which are the elementary operations of quantum algorithms. In silicon on insulator CMOS technologies, a quantum dot can be created in the silicon body underneath a field effect gate. In this case, the gate voltage creates a quantum well along the, sil the silicon channel, and the gate oxide, the buried oxide, and the shallow trench isolations provide confinement in the other direction. Uh, quantum dots can also be created in a quantum well of a, an heterostructure. In accumulation mode devices, uh, a positive voltage applied to uh, a Langer gate allows to um, accumulate electrons only locally in the quantum well, so forming the quantum dot. In uh, depletion mode devices, quantum dots are created by depleting locally a, a two dimensional electron gas or hole gas. In uh, electron hole spin qubits, the two basic states of the qubit are the spin up and spin down. Uh, states of an electron or a hole in a quantum dot. In absence of a magnetic field, the two spin states are degenerate, which means that they share the same energy. Uh, so we need to apply a static magnetic field, P0, in order to lift the degeneracy and create an energy separation, Ez, between the two states, which is directly proportional to the intensity P0 of the field. Also, 
The study in magnetic field causes the expectation value of the spin angular momentum to process about the z-axis with the Larmor frequency FL, which is equal to the energy separation EZ divided by the Planck constant. In order to manipulate the spin state, we can perturb the system with a small magnetic field B1 of t rotating at Larmor frequency in the xy plane, that is the plane uh, perpendicular to the static magnetic field. This causes the spin up probability to vary periodically with the duration of the perturbation. The dynamics of the system is typically studied in uh, um, a reference frame x1, y1, z, which is rotating at the Larmor frequency about the z-axis with respect to the absolute frame x, y, z. If we consider only the static magnetic field in the rotating frame, the spin angular momentum appears to be static and the fictitious magnetic field cancels the static magnetic field. In the rotating frame, the uh, magnetic field P1 appears to be static and the spin angular momentum processes about its axis with a frequency FR, which is directly proportional to the intensity B1 of the field, and that is called the Rabi frequency. The final spin state depends on the duration of the perturbation. For example, in a pi half rotation gate, the spin is uh, rotated by an angle pi half, and uh, a passive state can be transformed into a superposition state. Uh, instead, a, a pi um, rotation gate can cause a spin flip. The rotating field is typically approximated by an oscillating field B of T. In the absolute reference, reference frame, P of T can be decomposed in the sum of two counter-rotating magnetic field, the wanted component B1 and, the un and an unwanted component B2. In the rotating frame, B1 appears to be static, while B2 appears to be rotating at twice the Larmor frequency. So B2 is zero on average, and if the Rabi frequency is much smaller than the Larmor frequency, then the effect of B2 on the spin state is negligible. There are two main spin manipulation techniques. In electron spin resonance, the oscillating field P of T is generated by an AC current I of T flowing through a microstrip line deposited close to the qubits. In electric dipole spin resonance, an oscillating voltage is applied to the gate of a quantum dot. The resulting oscillating electric field causes an orbital motion of the electron in the quantum dot, and in turn, a spin rotation if spin orbit coupling is significant. Here we also summarize a, a selection of uh, readout techniques. The first two techniques require a, a quantum dot tunnel coupled to a charge reservoir. In energy selective readout, an electron in the excited state has an energy which is higher than the electrochemical potential mirrors of the charge reservoir and can tunnel out of the dot, while an electron in the ground state stays in the dot. In tunnel rate selective readout, uh, instead, also an electron in the ground state can tunnel out of the dot. However, an electron in the, in the excited state has a, a higher um, tunnel rate. The other two techniques require a double quantum dot. To exploit spin blockade, a double quantum dot uh, can be prepared with one electron uh, in each dot. Then tunneling from one dot into the other is only possible if the spins of the two electrons are anti-parallel, otherwise, tunneling is inhibited due to the pole explosion principle. Then the final spin state is inferred by counting the number of charges in one dot by means of a charge sensor. In gate reflectometry, an inductor is connected to the readout gate of the double quantum dot and form a, a resonator with the gate capacitance of the dot. Uh, then, the, under proper biasing of the double quantum dot, the gate, uh, the gate capacitance and thereby the reflection coefficient of the resonator depend on the speed state of the qubit. A qubit operation at 3 Kelvin requires an energy separation which is at least equal to 0 0.25 milli electron volt, that is the thermal energy KBT at 3 Kelvin. This corresponds to a Larmor frequency of approximately 60 gigahertz, which is the value that we considered in our study. The transimpedance amplifier must provide a transimpedance gain between 100 and 140 dB ohm in order to amplify uh, tunneling currents in the order of 10 picoampere to 10 nanoampere and convert 
them in an output voltage with a switch in the order of 1 millivolt on 50 ohm test equipment for experimental proof. The signal generator comprises a voltage control oscillator and its phase noise affects fidelity, which is a measure of how well a physical system implements a quantum gate. For the design of the VCO, we carried out fidelity considerations following the approach uh, reported by TU Delft. We considered a pi half rotation gate. In this case, the average gate fidelity is limited by the rotative wave approximation to 99.9% .9 if the Rabi frequency is equal to 1 80th of the Lamour frequency. This is seven, 750 megahertz in our case, or to 99.3% if the Rabi frequency is equal to 1 5th of the Lamour frequency, that is 12 gigahertz in our case. We considered 12 gigahertz as an extreme case. We estimated the phase noise required for a target infidelity of 125 times 10 to the minus six. In this table, we report the Rabi frequency, the pulse duration, the phase noise at one megahertz frequency offset from the Larmor frequency uh, carrier at 60 gigahertz, and uh, the uncertainty delta T of the, tool per, uh, of the pulse duration for the same target infidelity. The calculated values of phase noise are in both cases achievable in silicon, as we will show. We based our designs on the cryogenic characterization of the 22 nanometer FDSOI CMOS technology uh, down to 3.3 Kelvin, which is available in the literature. The transconductance of the MOSFETs improve at cryogenic temperatures, while the PKFD and PKFMAX current densities remain nearly constant. The passive devices exhibit lower losses while the normalized transconductance remains nearly constant below 77 Kelvin. For this reason, we designed the circuits at 300 Kelvin and then analyzed them down to 77 Kelvin. At these temperatures, the simulations converge, the models are accurate, and we can expect similar or better performances at 3 Kelvin. For the design of the signal generator, we first explore the possibility to generate the spin manipulation signal by switching on and off the VCO, which we implemented in a cross-couple differential pair topology. However, our VCO exhibited a settling time of approximately 200 picosecond, which was too long with respect to the post duration TP of 20 picosecond in the most extreme case. So we decided to encapsulate the VCO within two millimeter wave switches uh, in order to provide on-off amplitude modulation of uh, the Larmor frequency uh, carrier uh, generated by the VCO. The final signal must be fed uh, to the control gate of the double quantum dot. This plot reports the phase noise of the VCO at 300 Kelvin in black and 77 Kelvin in blue. The phase noise at one megahertz frequency offset from the 60 gigahertz carrier amounts to minus 90 dB carrier per hertz at 300 Kelvin and minus 100 dB carrier per hertz at 77 Kelvin. In both cases, the phase noise is well below minus 62 and minus 74 dB carrier per hertz as emerging from fidelity considerations. These two plots report the output signal VSG of the signal generator for a Rabi frequency of 700 megahertz and the Rabi frequency of 12 gigahertz. In both cases, the rise and fall times of the control voltage PC of the switches was set equal to delta T half and uh, uh, the output voltage VSG was generated correctly in both cases, despite the pulses are slightly longer due to switch non-idealities. The circuit topology of the transimpedance amplifier was mutated from design by the University of Toronto, uh, which is uh, one of the members of the Qubits Consortium. But uh, in this case, we consider only two inductors instead of three for improved scalability. All transistors are biased at a peak of max current density, and the input stage MOSFETs are sized for minimum input preferred noise current spectral density, INTIA. Um, these plots report the simulation results at 300 Kelvin in black and 77 Kelvin in blue. In detail, we report the parameters C21, S21, and S22, and INTIA. At 300 Kelvin, the TIA achieves a, a Z21 of 108 dB ohm, so meeting the performance considerations, exhibits a wide bandwidth and low noise with a, a, a small power consumption of 4.9 millivolts. At a lower temperature of 77 Kelvin, the gain, bandwidth and, non and noise performance improves despite a slight increase in the power consumption. Uh, to conclude, we summarize the main techniques for control and readout of electron hole spin qubits. 
and reported the preliminary design of the signal generator and transimpedance amplifier in 22 nanometer FTSO ICMOS technology. The signal generator uh, generates correctly the 60 gigahertz sinusoidal pulses for pi half rotation gates with rabbit frequency up to 12 gigahertz and minimum pulse, dur pulse duration of 20 picoseconds. The transimpedance amplifier meets the uh, transimpedance gain requirement and future works will address the physical implementation and experimental verifications down to 3 kelvin. We would like to acknowledge our sponsors and to invite you to visit the Qubits website www.qubits.eu to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, and to subscribe to our newsletter. I thank you for your attention.